Today, North Korea's state-run media threatened that any attempt to remove Kim Jong-un as leader would result in a nuclear strike on the U.S. Also today, a Senate committee looked at U.S. policy towards North Korea and the security risks it poses. This is an hour and a half. This hearing will come to order. Let me welcome you all to the fifth hearing for the Senate Foreign Relations Subcommittee on East Asia, the Pacific, and International Cybersecurity Policy in the 115th Congress. Uh, on behalf of the committee, I apologize for uh, the delay in the beginning of this hearing to the witnesses who have uh, been here time away from work, as well as those attending the hearing today. Um, action on the floor, including the return of Senator McCain, um, was a very poignant moment uh, for the Senate. I would like to welcome all to today's, here, to today's hearing. North Korea has emerged as the most urgent national security challenge for the U.S., the United States, and our allies in East Asia. Secretary Mattis has said North Korea is the most urgent and dangerous threat to peace and security. Admiral Gortney, the former commander of U.S. Northern Command, stated that the Korean Peninsula is at its most unstable point since 1953 when the armistice was signed. Last year alone, North Korea conducted two nuclear tests and a staggering 24 ballistic missile launches. This year, Pyongyang has already launched 17 missiles, including the July 4th successful test of an interco intercontinental ballistic missile that is reportedly capable of reaching Alaska and Hawaii. Patience is not an option with the U.S. homeland in the nuclear shadow of Kim Jong-un. Our North Korea policy of decades of bipartisan failure must turn to one of bipartisan success with pressure and global cooperation resulting in the peaceful denuclearization of the regime. President Trump has said the United States will not allow that to happen, and I am encouraged by the President's resolve. As Vice President Pence stated during his recent visit to South Korea, since 1992, the United States and our allies have stood together for a denuclearized, North, uh, denuclearized Korean Peninsula. We hope to achieve this objective through peaceable means, but all options are on the table but time is not on our side. I believe U.S. policy toward North Korea should be straightforward. The United States will deploy every economic, diplomatic, and if necessary, military tool at our disposal to deter Pyongyang and to protect our allies. However, the road to peacefully stopping Pyongyang undoubtedly lies through Beijing. China is the only country that holds the diplomatic and economic leverage necessary to put the real squeeze on the North Korean regime. According to the South Korean State Trade Agency, China accounts for 90% of North Korea's trade, including virtually all of North Korea's exports. From 2000 to 2015, trade volume between the two nations has climbed more than tenfold, rising from $488 million in 2000 to $5.4 billion in 2005. Beijing is the reason the regime acts so boldly and with relatively few consequences. China must now move beyond an articulation of concern and lay out a transparent path of focused pressure to denuclearize North Korea. A global power that borders this regime cannot simply throw up its hands and absolve themselves of responsibility. The administration is right to pursue a policy of maximum pressure toward North Korea, and we have a robust toolbox that is already available to ramp up the sanctions track, a track that has hardly been utilized to its fullest extent. Last Congress, I led the North Korea Sanctions and Policy Enhan Enhancement Act, which passed the Senate by a vote of 96 to nothing. This legislation was the first standalone legislation in Congress regarding North Korea to impose mandatory sanctions on the regime's proliferation activities, human rights violations, and malicious cyber behavior. According to recent analysis from the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies, North Korea's sanctions have more than doubled since that uh, legislation came into effect on February 18, 2016. Prior to that date, North Korea ranked eighth behind Ukraine, Russia, Iran, Iraq, the Balkans, Syria, Sudan, and Zimbabwe. Even with the 130% sanctions increase after the legislation passed this Congress, North Korea is today still only the fifth most sanctioned country by the United States. So while Congress has clearly moved the Obama administration from an action to some action, the Trump administration has the opportunity to use these authorities to build maximum leverage with not only Pyongyang, but also with Beijing. I'm encouraged by the actions the administration took last month to finally designate a Chinese financial institution, but this should just be the beginning. 
The administration, with congressional support, should now make it clear to any entity doing business with North Korea that they will not be able to do business with the United States or have access to the U.S. financial system. A report released last month by an independent organization, C4ADS, identified over 5,000 Chinese companies that are doing business with North Korea. These Chinese companies are responsible for $7 billion in trade with North Korea. Moreover, the report found that only 10 of these companies, 10 of these companies, control 30% of Chinese exports to North Korea in 2016. One of these companies alone was responsible for nearly 10% of total imports from North Korea. Some of these companies were found to have satellite offices in the United States. According to recent disclosures from 2009 to 2017, North Korea used Chinese banks to process at least $2.2 billion in transactions through the U.S. financial system. It should all stop now, and it must stop now. The United States should not be afraid of a diplomatic confrontation with Beijing for simply enforcing existing U.S. law. In fact, it should be more afraid of Congress if it does not. As for any prospect of engagement, we should continue to let Beijing know in no uncertain terms that the United States will not negotiate with Pyongyang at the expense of U.S. national security and that of our allies. Instead of working with the United States and the international community to disarm the madman in Pyongyang, Beijing has called on the United States and South Korea to halt our military exercises in exchange for vague promises of North Korea suspending its missile and nuclear activities. That was a bad deal, and the Trump administration was right to reject it. Moreover, before any talks in any format, the United States and our partners must demand that Pyongyang first meet the denuclearization commitments it had already agreed to in the past and subsequently chose to brazenly violate. President Trump should continue to impress with President Xi that a denuclearized Korean peninsula is in both nations' fundamental long-term interests. As Admiral Harry Harris rightly noted recently, we want to bring Kim Jong-un to his senses, not to his knees. But to achieve this goal, Beijing must be made to choose whether it wants to work with the United States as a responsible global leader to stop Pyongyang or bear consequences of keeping him in power. Uh, I will uh, turn it over to Senator Markey as soon as Senator Markey arrives, uh, but in the meantime, uh, he has agreed to allow our witness who's waited patiently for uh, an hour uh, to begin testimony, Susan Thornton on our first panel. Uh, our first panel is the Honorable Susan Thornton, who serves as Acting Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia and Pacific Affairs. Susan Thornton assumed responsibility as Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary in February of 2016 after serving for a year and a half as Deputy Assistant Secretary. Secretary Thornton joined the State Department in 1991 and is a career member of the Foreign Service. Welcome, Secretary Thornton, and thank you for your patience, and thank you for being here with us today, and we'll begin your testimony. Thank you very much, Chairman Gardner. It's great to see you, and thank you very much for inviting me to appear before you today on this really important, urgent uh, issue for both the United States, our allies, and regional security, and I would say global security. Uh, North Korea's July 4th intercontinental ballistic missile test is only the latest evidence of Kim Jong-un's desire to threaten the United States with nuclear weapons. It constitutes a serious escalation of the DPRK's nuclear and ballistic missile programs. Our goal is to protect our country, our citizens, and our allies by halting and eliminating North Korea's development of nuclear weapons and the means to deliver them. The administration's strategy to achieve this goal uses diplomatic, economic, and other tools to build concerted global pressure on Pyongyang to abandon its internationally proscribed nuclear and missile programs. North Korea needs to understand that the only path to international legitimacy, regime security, and economic prosperity is a denuclearized Korean peninsula. There are three components to our strategy. The first is UN action. In concert with our Asian allies, we have called on all UN member states to fully implement the strong sanctions required in the UN Security Council resolutions 2321, 2270, and 2356. And we will continue to work to increase international sanctions. The second component is diplomatic action by UN member states. We have urged countries around the world to take their own actions to express their condemnation, such as suspending or downgrading diplomatic relations with North Korea. Cordial ties with a country that threatens its neighbors and continues to violate numerous UN resolutions is completely inappropriate at this time. We've seen evidence that North Korea violates international norms by using its diplomatic missions to generate and transmit illicit resources for its weapons programs. 
The third component is economic pressure. We have asked all countries to cut trade ties with Pyongyang as a way of increasing North Korea's economic isolation and to prevent it from using the international financial system to support its illegal weapons programs. Secretary Tillerson has made clear in meetings with his foreign counterparts that nations can no longer operate in a business as usual approach. Our ambassadors have reinforced this message in capitals around the globe. Mr. Chairman, we are not seeking regime change, nor do we seek military conflict or to threaten North Korea. Our pressure campaign is designed to make the cost of the regime's programs too exorbitant. As, we have, as has been said, we want to bring North Korea to its senses and not to its knees. However, we will respond accordingly to threats against us or our allies. We remain open to talks with the DPRK, but it must first cease its unlawful nuclear and missile programs and bring an end to its pattern of dangerous, aggressive behavior in the region. We are not going to negotiate our way back to the negotiating table. While our partners around the globe have begun to take steps to increase pressure on North Korea, unfortunately, we do not see any signs that North Korea is willing to engage in credible talks on denuclearization at this time. We will continue to appeal to countries around the world to take actions in opposition to North Korea's unlawful ballistic missile and nuclear programs to make clear to the DPRK that pursuing its unlawful programs will only increase its isolation. While addressing the threat to our homeland and our allies is our most pressing concern, we will not abandon the three U.S. citizens who have been unjustly detained by North Korea, nor will we be silent in speaking out against the regime's egregious human rights violations against its own people. The State Department will soon impose a travel restriction forbidding U.S. nationals to use an American passport to travel in, through, or to North Korea. We seek to avoid another tragedy like that which Otto Warmbier and his family endured. In very specific, limited circumstances, uh, American citizens can apply for a waiver to this travel restriction to allow them to perform humanitarian work. We do not wish to punish the North Korean people for the actions of their leadership and therefore plan to allow for some exceptions to our travel restriction. We appreciate the strong interest in this issue from Congress and we look forward to continuing our cooperation and protecting our country from this grave threat to international stability. And thank you again for inviting me to testify today and I look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you, Secretary, Secretary Thornton. And as I mentioned, uh, uh, when Senator Markey arrives, we will uh, turn to him for his uh, opening comments and questions as well. Uh, I just wanted to start with a couple questions uh, to you, Secretary Thornton, regarding the uh, maximum pressure campaign, do you think the administration needs additional tools? Does the administration need additional tools, additional sanctions authorities from Congress to fully implement the maximum pressure campaign or policy? Sorry. Um, I would say that um, one of the, there's been several things that the administration has done uh, in light of the review that we conducted on North Korea policy and in implementing the strategy that we have in place right now. The first is to make North Korea the highest priority national security issue that we are facing. And you've heard Secretary Madison, the President, and the Secretary and others speak to this. Um, the second thing that we're doing is we are making this a real global campaign and uh, putting the onus on other countries in the international community to examine their relationships with North Korea, both diplomatic, economic, financial, trading, and asking them to uh, make sure that not only are they implementing the um, very sweeping UN sanctions regime that has already been put in place, but that they're going beyond the, that regime to um, initiate their own actions to show the North Koreans that they will not be able to seek solace or comfort in the international community anywhere. And this is part of maintaining a global network to show that we are unified in our efforts to thwart their ambitions. Uh, the third thing uh, that we're doing is really working, putting the onus on China. As you said, 90% of the uh, North Korean economy is flowing through China in one form or another. And uh, I think this is a real departure from previous approaches on this issue. Putting the onus on China to step up, as you said, be a, a, a responsible global player and uh, really 
use its uh, tools to up the pressure on the regime in North Korea and make clear that China will only accept a denuclearized Korean peninsula and that they are prepared to uh, impinge on the North Korean economy in ways that are much more serious than they've done in the past. Um, I think as far as the tools that we have at hand for conducting this strategy, uh, we do have very broad authorities already existing. Uh, we're um, already uh, undertaking a sweeping assessment of all of the violations of sanctions that we can detect that are going on in various uh, countries around the world, including in China. We've uh, been working with some of those countries to um, take action against entities that we find that are violating these sanctions, and we have very broad authorities to do to do so. So I would say uh, I don't think that there's any lack of tools that are keeping us from pr prosecuting a very active uh, sanctions campaign, both within the ambit of the UN Security Council resolution sanctions, but also within our own unilateral kind of designations and secondary sanctions against entities that we find to be violative. And outside of this hearing, have you made that position known that you have the authorities that you need to both chambers of uh, the Congress? Um, not aware specifically, but I believe that that is our position, yeah. Thank you. Uh, and uh, have you had a chance to review some of the other pieces of legislation either in the House uh, regarding North Korea sanctions? Uh, and uh, in the Senate, I've introduced along with others and on this committee, legislation uh, regarding North Korea and sanctions, particularly relating to access to financial networks and systems. Uh, could you comment a little bit on those pieces of legislation? Um, sure, yes. There, there are quite a number of pieces of legislation, and we definitely appreciate the interest of uh, Congress in this issue. And um, I think, uh, you know, what I would say is that um, the authorities that we have, again, I think they're quite sweeping uh, authorities that were passed in the legislation from 2016, the North Korea Sanctions Enhancement Act that you mentioned, and the executive orders that followed from that gave us very broad authorities um, to go after entities that we find um, that are violating sanctions or U.S. laws or the U.N. sanctions. So I think uh, um, the new pieces of legislation, there are various um, uh, targets. One was on the travel restriction or travel ban. One is on North Korean human rights. So there are a number of different aspects that they touch on. And um, I think, in general, we've been consulting closely with staffs on those, and we appreciate the interest. The, the round of uh, designations that you mentioned, you talked about uh, sanctioning a Chinese financial institution and other measures, uh, secondary sanctions. When can we expect the next round of designations that include Chinese entities and financial institutions? Uh, we have been uh, working on coming up with a new uh, list of entities that we think are violating, and I think um, there's no specific timetable, but there's no specific, uh, you know, uh, hesitation to do that. We will be proceeding with those as soon as we can get target packages ready to go and get uh, the um, sort of um, evidentiary standards and legal standards met that we need to meet. Can we expect additional sanctions within the next 30 days? Um, I would hesitate to predict exact timetables, but I think you'll see something fairly soon, yes. And will this, uh, these sanctions, will they be presented to uh, China or uh, others uh, prior to the enactment of the sanctions to give them a chance to correct, or will they just be implemented immediately? Uh, well, uh, we have been uh, in running conversations with China and other countries about information that we have on, on entities. Um, and in some cases, we uh, try to coordinate on actions with them, uh, with local law enforcement to, to our law enforcement actions. And in some cases, we are unable to do that. So I, I, I can't say specifically with regard to what we're considering, but we've done both in the past, and we're not bound by any particular arrangement. When you see a report like the C4ADS report that shows over 5,000 entities doing business with China, uh, does that provide uh, evidence that you can use? Does that go into a conversation with the, the Chinese government, and what is their response? 
So we have had a number of conversations. I myself have had multiple conversations with my Chinese counterparts, and whenever we have a report like this, we bring it to them and ask them to look into it, and they, and they have done that. And usually they come back to us with some kind of a response, which we either follow up on or, um, or not. But I mean, usually we, we definitely share that kind of information. In your testimony, you talk, and you mentioned it in the answer to your question, uh, three components that serve as pillars of the strategy. Uh, called on UN members, uh, states to fully implement the commitments they've made regarding North Korea. You've urged countries to suspend or downgrade diplomatic relations with North Korea and asked all countries to cut trade ties with Pyongyang. Uh, could you give me uh, an indication of the success of those requests? Uh, how, many, how many member nations of the United Nations have suspended or downgraded diplomatic relations with North Korea that you have requested to do so? Uh, how many have cut trade ties with Pyongyang that we have requested to do so? I can't give you specific numbers, but we have urged everybody to squeeze diplomatic representation or downgrade if they can. Um, there are a number of countries that have expelled DPRK representatives from their, from their capitals who have diminished their presence in Pyongyang of their diplomatic missions, have expelled um, representatives of commercial offices or other entities that were transacting um, illicitly with uh, the host government and that we've provided information on. So um, I can't give you the exact number, but there are quite a number that have responded to our call for diminishing diplomatic presence. We've also had a number of countries respond to the call for diminishing uh, commercial operations that are sponsored by diplomatic establishments. And I think um, we've had, for example, Germany has uh, committed to take steps to close a hostel there that was being run by the North Korean diplomatic mission, uh, which provided revenue for the mission's operations. So we've had a number of successes on that front as well. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the timing of the travel ban? Yeah, so uh, we believe that in the coming week, within the coming week, we will publish a notice in the Federal Register outlining the period of consultation and what we're proposing, which is a general travel restriction. That will be in the Federal Register for a 30-day comment period. And the proposal is to, I think as you know, make US passports not valid for travel into North Korea unless you get a, an, an application is made for um, a one-time trip and you get an, uh, a license or a, a sort of a permission to, to make that trip. Um, and so that'll be in is the that trip uh, allowable under a humanitarian exemption. Is that the, the purpose of that allowance? Right, right. Yeah. It, for the subsequent app, you'd have to make an in-person application for a trip. To and are we encouraging that. other nations to do the same and have others uh, made the same decision? Uh, we have encouraged other people to um, you know, make uh, decisions about restricting travel and other, because tourism is obviously also a, uh, a resource for the regime that we would like to see uh, diminished. Um, I don't think so far there are other people that have pursued this, but this will be sort of the initial one and we will keep uh, talking to others about that. Thank you, Secretary Thornton. And as uh, promised, I'll turn to, to Senator Markey for any opening comments you would make. Uh, uh, Secretary Thornton has already given her testimony and so proceed into questions if you'd like to immediately. Okay, beautiful. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, and we apologize to everyone. It's a, it's a, a very um, unusual day here in <coughs> the um, Congress historic. And, uh, and so we apologize, but we think this is as well. A historic issue that has to be dealt with uh, in the very near term. So I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for convening this hearing and to our three witnesses for being here. Assistant Secretary Thornton, you are the first Trump administration official to testify on North Korea in an open hearing uh, before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Since taking office, President Trump and his policymakers have made inconsistent and sometimes conflicting public comments on this sensitive matter. I hope your testimony will provide needed clarity. North Korea continues to develop its nuclear and missile programs without constraint. Over the past 18 months, it has conducted its fourth and fifth nuclear test, tested over 20 ballistic missiles, and launched a satellite into orbit. On July 4th, North Korea tested an inter intercontinental ballistic missile, or ICBM. This represents a startling advance in Pyongyang's arsenal. 
And just hours ago, the Washington Post reported that the Defense Intelligence Agency now assesses North Korea could field a reliable, nuclear-capable intercontinental ballistic missile as early as next year, two years sooner than previously thought. We and our allies must remain resolute and united to deter this threat. Kim Jong-un's reckless brutality leaves no doubt that he is homicidal. But at the same time, his calculated survival strategy shows that he is not suicidal. Like his father and grandfather before him, Kim knows that an attack on the United States or our allies will bring an immediate and devastating military response. For that reason, so far deterrence has worked. But as Kim builds nuclear weapons and the situation continues to drift without diplomatic resolution, he may eventually misread our military deterrent posture as preparation for an imminent attack to topple his regime. I believe that continued diplomatic drift only increases the risk of unintended war with potentially grave consequences. Just three days ago, General Joe Dunford, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, said that war on the Korean Peninsula, quote, would be horrific, a loss of life unlike any we have experienced in our lifetimes. And I mean anyone who's been alive since World War II. This echoed comments by Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis earlier this year. It is clear that there is no military solution to this problem, and pressure without direct diplomatic engagement will bring only continued drift. We need a bold new approach. I believe that only direct diplomatic engagement backed by unprecedented economic pressure will bring a peaceful solution to the North Korea problem. That is why I've joined with Chairman Gardner in leading the North Korean Enablers Accountability Act. We believe that the United States needs to make it crystal clear that, the, that our country will impose unprecedented economic pressure on North Korea and its enablers. And we need to give the administration potent diplomatic tools with which to bring that North Korean regime to the table for serious direct negotiations. But no matter how many sanctions tools we give the president, pressure cannot bring North Korea to the table unless we are willing to talk to them. Now is the time for the administration to clearly state its diplomatic engagement strategy, the circumstances under which it will agree to direct engagement with North Korea, and how it intends to use sanctions and other tools to bring Kim to the table for serious talks. So this is, without question, Mr. Chairman, a very important uh, hearing. And I do have a yeah, question. Please proceed to your questions. If, please, thank please. you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. So Secretary Thornton, part of the North Korea challenge at present is that the administration has announced a policy of maximum pressure and engagement, but has not articulated as of yet what that means or the strategy for implementing it specifically with respect to diplomatic engagement. President Trump has spoken of the chances of a major, major conflict with North, the, North Korea, quote unquote, but has also said he would be honored to meet with Kim Jong-un and that he was a smart cookie. Other administration officials, including Vice President Pence and Secretary Tillerson, have given similarly contradictory statements. And frankly, Secretary Thornton, uh, this, your opening statement still hasn't clarified exactly where the administration has to be or is today. You mentioned lessons that guided us in developing our current strategy, which has three components that serve as the pillars, but did not elaborate on what that strategy or the pillars are. Calls for UN member states to fully enforce sanctions and urging countries to isolate North Korea all sound like things that previous administrations have also done. So can you explain to us what the administration's current strategy is and how it is bringing us closer to the ultimate goal of peacefully denuclearizing the, North, the Korean Peninsula. Yeah, I think, can you hear me? 
Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, Senator Markey, for, for your statement and, and for these questions. I mean, this is obviously a very difficult issue. Some of us have been working on this issue for more years than we'd care to count, and I think in the room here we probably have uh, millennia of experience on this issue. Unfortunately, we have not come up with a solution that has uh, allowed us to, to solve this issue in the way that we hope to see it solved, which is the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. The denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula is the administration's goal here. That is what we are, are going after. I think the Secretary and others have made clear that we want to, our, it's our preference to resolve this issue peacefully, to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula in a peaceful manner. Um, that said, um, it seems that Kim Jong-un and the North Korean regime are quite dedicated to developing these weapons and have not so far demonstrated any, um, you know, they have not demonstrated any inclination to join us for negotiations on the dismantlement and abandonment of the nuclear weapons. So what, what the administration is saying then is that you believe in a negotiated settlement of this issue of the development of nuclear weapons and intercontinental ballistic missiles by uh, North Korea. Um, but thus far, the administration has been unwilling to actually negotiate. Well, thus with far North we Korea. haven't had a partner. Sorry to interrupt, but that, thus far we haven't had a partner with whom uh, we could negotiate, and we have, have had. You, a, have you asked for negotiations with the North Koreans? We have uh, asked. We the North Koreans know how to get in touch with us. I appreciate are, that, but yeah. you know how to get in touch with them. Have we you do know how to get have in you, touch with have them? Have you asked for? Uh, uh, negotiations to commence with um, the North Koreans well, I think in conjunction with the Chinese or, uh, or uh, the Japanese, but have you asked for that uh, specific um, uh, negotiation to occur and for, uh, uh, and for us to actually construct a framework by which we can uh, begin to resolve this issue? Yeah, well, I mean, at this point, um all of our uh, allies, partners, and others that are involved in trying to help and cooperate to address this issue and solve this problem, none of, none of us have gotten um, a positive response from the North Korea when uh, the topic of a serious conversation, a serious negotiation about their nuclear program has come up. So in the face of that intransigence, our strategy is to increase the pressure on the Korean, North Korean regime to try to change its calculus, to change the cost-benefit analysis in Pyongyang surrounding these programs. And at the same time, we are constantly evaluating and um, probing to see if we are having that desired effect. Uh, I think that you know it's certainly the case that ratcheting up sanctions pressure is not uh, like a cobra strike. It's definitely a slow squeeze, a slow tightening of the screws. And I think, um, you know, we're, we're definitely in the process of trying to elevate that pressure and change the calculus. We have not uh, gotten there yet, which I think was what I mentioned in my statement. But I think we also think that sanctions over time and pressure over time, uh, unified global network over time can have the effect to, of, of changing that calculation in, in the, on the part of the DPRK regime, and that's what we're seeking to do. And if, if, I mean, some people say this won't work, but I say we have to test this hypothesis and test it uh, at the point where we bring the maximum amount of pressure. Well, uh, Senator Gardner and I and other members of this committee, we clearly want to intensify the level of pressure on North Korea. Uh, they enjoyed a 37% increase in trade with the Chinese uh, from year to year, from 2016 into the beginning of 2017. Uh, when we uh, began the deployment of the THAAD, that has now led to a $10 million, uh, $10 billion a year economic sanction that China is imposing on South Korea. 
in its tourism sector. So from our perspective, uh, the strategy which we have is not working. We need legislation uh, that will ensure that there is a tightening of these sanctions, but it can only work if it's done in conjunction with negotiations uh, that uh, begin, uh, uh, but with the sure and certain knowledge uh, that these sanctions are arriving uh, so that you can extract the strongest possible uh, result. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I see that Senator Kane has arrived, yes, so Senator I will Kane. end my questions right now and so that Senator thank Kane you. can Senator Kane's be recognized. recognized. Th thank you to my colleagues and thank you for your testimony. And forgive me if I ask questions that were asked while I was coming from an Armed Services Committee hearing. Um, it was, I think, on the 21st of June, the U.S. and China held the first iteration of the diplomatic and security dialogue. What steps did the administration take during that dialogue with China to urge them to increase pressure on North Korea? Because when we met with the administration at the White House, that was in classified settings, so I'm not going to go into it too in, in any detail, but um, I think we all realized the, the leverage that China has is not being deployed sufficiently to change North Korean behavior. There's much more leverage that can be deployed. And when we hear about China sanctioning South Korea over efforts that South Korea is taking just to defend itself, um, it, it seems like that not only we're not using our leverage, we may be going backwards. So can you tell me about the dialogue between U.S. and China in June 21 about the North Korea issue? Yeah, sure. Thank you very much, Senator, for that question. And first, let me start off by saying that we deplore and have spoken out publicly about how disappointed we are about China's actions with respect to South Korea over the THAAD deployment. Of course, the THAAD deployment is merely a defensive system that's going to be used to protect South Korea, protect our troops, and it's certainly within the rights of South Korea to deploy a defensive system. And we have made, in, in the context of the diplomatic and security dialogue, raised our disappointment again over that issue and uh, insisted with the Chinese that we continue to uh, discuss it and that they, uh, you know, retract all of the uh, negative ramifications that flowed from that uh, decision. Uh, with regard to the sanctions uh, on North Korea and with regard to the discussions on North Korea in general, um, I think uh, what we had hoped to do in the diplomatic and security dialogue in the period running up to that, where there was a lot of active diplomacy, was convince the Chinese to take serious action against their own entities um, that we found that were in violation of some sanctions uh, provisions. And once, after the diplomatic and security dialogue, we had a chance to talk through with the Chinese how we saw it. Um, then I think you saw following from that discussion the decision to proceed with the sanctioning of a number of Chinese entities. And uh, we've had a number of conversations with China where we've said we would prefer to work through the UN sanctions because obviously if you have a UN Security Council resolution, it's an international sanction that sweeps up the entirety of the global network that we're trying to build. Um, and we would prefer to cooperate with China on going after entities that we see in violation of those sanctions, but that we're perfectly prepared to act on our own to target entities that we find it necessary to target that are um, in violation of the sanctions. And so I think the Chinese are now very clear that we're going to go after um, Chinese entities if need be, if we find them to be in violation, and if the Chinese feel they can't cooperate in going after those targets, um, that there's no um, uh, block on us acting on our own. The, this committee acted in 2016 to do sanctions that were followed on pretty quickly. I mean, not only through the body to signed by the president, but then they were followed on pretty quickly by the UN Security Council, and China did not choose to exercise its veto in those. But I'm curious. Um, are there major differences in the way, you know, sort of they interpret the sanctions and we interpret them? Do we run into interpretive, you know, uh, uh, disagreements where we think that it should be more maximal and they're claiming that it's not? T tell me a little bit about the relationship yeah. with China, even over the understanding what these sanctions right. mean. Um, 
so we've had six UN Security Council resolutions against North Korea since 2006, five of those with sanctions, mm -hmm. all of them adopted by consensus mm -hmm. in the Security Council, so no, no vetoes, which shows the degree to which North Korea is a complete flagrant outlier in the international mm -hmm. system. A Chinese vote for these uh, UN Security Council resolutions, they are opposed to all of North Korea's violative behavior, uh, but in the details of the sanctions, and there is a UN panel of experts that monitors the sanctions and the implementation and interprets, and uh, we work very closely with the panel of experts and the Chinese also work very closely with them. I mean, the Chinese have a lot more uh, trade going on with North Korea. They have a very long border with North Korea, and so they have, first of all, differences in interpretation of some of the sanctions and more um, uh, kind of tangibly a differences in how they can uh, implement the sanctions. They have a lot more work to do to implement the sanctions, um, obviously at the borders, with uh, inspections of customs, with tracking financial transactions, et cetera. So they um, are both uh, having a difference with regard also to their domestic laws and how they enact domestic laws to implement UN sanctions than, than what the system is that we have. If, if I could ask one more question, Mr. Chairman, just about up against my time. These guys have been on the subcommittee for a while and are more experts than me. I, I am a Middle East and Latin America guy who just added to this subcommittee, so I always ask like questions that others know about already. But help me understand Chinese behavior on this. They did not veto the sanction, the, the, the sanctions as you've mentioned. They disagree on application issues, but that may not be quite so unusual. They're on the border and they're doing trade with it. It affects them more than it does us that we would have a different point of view. But then they would sanction South Korea for taking steps that are clearly defensive in nature. I mean, that seems so much more extreme even than battling about, well, what is the UN Security Council resolution? I mean, when South Korea is taking steps that are clearly defensive in nature to protect itself against what everybody agrees is sanctionable behavior within the UN context that should cause grave concern by a border uh, neighbor uh, as well as other nations in the region. I, I, I have a hard time understanding what the sanction about South Korea is. I can't interpret in any light other than a really hostile and unhelpful one. So help me understand it. I, I think your interpretation is, uh, is perfectly uh, legitimate. I mean, we we have the same conversation, which is this is a defensive system. The Chinese don't believe it's a defensive system, um, but we've tried to explain that you know we can have a technical conversation and explain to you exactly why you're wrong, but they um, have not come to the same conclusion on that. So I think um, you know. We continue to point out to them that this is a completely unjustified uh, kind of behavior, and um, I, I think on the on the reaction to the Thad system, I can't. I mean, I can't explain exactly why they're doing what mm -hmm. they're doing, but I think you know, seeing it as unreasonable is perfectly legitimate. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Kane. Uh, Secretary Thornton, just another round of questions. I'll be brief uh, in my in my comments and questions here. Uh, just make it clear, there will be additional sanctions uh, issued on Chinese entities and others who are violating our sanction and UN sanctions. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, and they, those will be issued shortly. Is that correct? Um, shortly within the next... I mean, it's not the State Department that issues them. Correct. So, yes, within... Thank you. Yes. Uh, wanted to follow up on, on human rights. Will any of these actions include violations of human rights by the North Korean regime? I'm sorry. The, well, what, the these, what, what are these sanctions or any other measures oh, address the, the violations of human rights by North Korea? Um, it's, it's possible. I'm not exactly sure exactly which ones are going to be included in the next uh, tranche, but it's, it's possible. Certainly we still have the North Korea uh, human rights uh, sanctions um, provided for in legislation, and we have the authority to do that. Okay. Uh, the, the other and final question before I turn it over to Senator Markey, uh, cyber capabilities. Uh, we in the last Congress passed legislation requiring mandatory cyber sanctions when we find a violation by uh, North Korea uh, under the terms of the legislation. In the conversations over the past several months, we've talked about some of the ransomware attacks that have gone viral, uh, spread around the globe. Um, does the United States plan to utilize, the State Department, Treasury Department plan to utilize the cyber sanctions authority under the previous legislation? 
Yeah, I believe that, um, of course, we are well aware of um, malicious cyber activity emanating from North Korea, and we're very concerned about it. Um, I think uh, when we have the opportunity to use this authority, we certainly would use it and wouldn't hesitate. Thank you. Uh, Senator Markey. Um, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman, again. And, uh, uh, and we thank you for being here, Secretary Thornton. This is a very important discussion. And again, I, I continue you know, my line of questioning, again, referencing back to the Washington Post story of just two hours ago, saying that our own defense intelligence agency now believes um, that they could deploy uh, a reliable, nuclear-capable, intercontinental ballistic missile next year. So time is of the essence. Um, this is the last best chance we're going to have to deter them. And so the legislation which we have pending um, before this committee and that we intend on moving uh, and is the subject of this hearing is to impose broad sanctions on 10 Chinese companies identified specifically as doing the largest amount of business uh, with the North Korean government. Uh, and we want to move on this rapidly so that the Chinese know that we're serious and the North Koreans know that we're serious. Uh, and we now know that uh, time is running out. Um, once they have that intercontinental ballistic missile nuclear capable uh, ability, it will be very difficult to roll that back. So again, what is the administration's views on this legislation um, that we have pending before the committee? Are, it, it does, does the Trump administration support it, oppose it, or are you neutral? Well, we certainly um, would support um, you know, going after entities that are violating the sanctions. And I can't say without knowing what the list of entities exactly is and having a lot more information about what they've been doing um, kind of what kinds of uh, violations they are, they are uh, looking at. But we would certainly not hesitate to go after companies that we have uh, that kind of information on. So um, I think uh, we are sort of in the same uh, mode of wanting to ratchet up the pressure on the North Korean regime quickly as far as signaling to North Korea about what it is we're trying to do since um, they don't seem to be willing to have enter into a, a serious negotiation, we are trying to let them know through other uh, means, you know, what it is that our goal is, what it is that we're trying to do, and what it is that we're not trying to do. And I think the secretary's been very clear about that we're not pursuing uh, regime change in North Korea. We're not pursuing um, a collapse or an accelerated um, reunification. That we are genuinely focused on the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. We've done our part in South Korea. There are no nuclear weapons, and it's now uh, up to uh, North Korea to come to the table, hopefully encouraged by um, the sanctions and also encouraged by other um, incentives. Right. My question goes to what is the conversation between the Trump administration and the Chinese government? What are you saying to the Chinese government about the intention of the United States to tighten in a vice-like grip sanctions on those companies that are cooperating with the North Korean government, uh, including the 10 companies that we include in this legislation towards the goal of moving to direct negotiations with the North Koreans, having the Chinese working with us. So what is that conversation? That's what we're trying to yeah. elicit. It, because obviously when there's a 37% increase in trade with North Korea and China and a $10 billion a year hit on the South Korean uh, 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 gov uh, uh, economy uh, as they cooperate with the United States in the deployment of the THAAD, Right now, they're not feeling any pressure. It's just business as usual coasting towards that moment where they have a nuclear weapons program that is successful 
in being able to reach our country. So what exactly are you saying to the Chinese leaders? Well, we, we have had the conversation about our intention to tighten the vice grip of sanctions with regard to companies that are violating. We're also, um, of course, working on new international sanctions uh, through the UN, and I think uh, U.S. UN Ambassador Haley had a statement about that this morning that um, that the Chinese have proposed additional um, some additional measures and that things are things are um, were positive in the conversations we're having with China about instituting additional international sanctions as a response to the ICBM launch on July 4th. But we're also uh, telling them quite up front that we will not hesitate to take additional actions against Chinese companies that are uh, violating the sanctions with North Korea. I haven't had, I haven't told them the 10, list of 10 companies that, that, that is in your bill, but we've been talking to them about a lot of other entities and companies um, that we have information about that are involved with North Korea and that we are proceeding uh, to try to um, move against. So what are you telling the Chinese are the conditions under which we w are willing to engage in direct talks with the North Koreans? The Chinese has want, have asked us to engage in direct negotiations with the North Koreans. What have you said uh, to China about what those conditions would be that would bring us to direct talks? What, is, what, what are the conditions you have given to the Chinese? We haven't given them a list of conditions, but we've told them, as I think I mentioned in my statement, that um, a start would be a moratorium on testing of uh, missiles and nuclear devices and, uh, um, and a diminishing of uh, provocative behavior. I mean, that would be the first uh, sort of step in moving and, and, toward and what, a negotiation, not, I mean, we would like to see some seriousness on the part of North Korea about abandoning its, its weapons program. So, so you're please. saying the North Korea has to make concessions before we'll begin negotiations. Is that the position of the Trump well, administration? Well, North Korea doesn't have to make concessions. It has to stop its UN Security Council resolution violative illicit behavior, and, and we don't see that as a concession. Well, I, I appreciate that, but you have to look at it from the perspective of the North Koreans as well, which is why you know, going to direct, direct negotiation with a much tougher sanctions program surrounding its economy in cooperation with the Chinese is, the, from my perspective, correct formula to get uh, a result before next year when it becomes irreversible. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Markey. Senator Portman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And as Senator Markey has described, you know, we have big challenges with North Korea, and over the period of the last couple of decades, um, a few different administrations, we've tried different things which haven't worked. Um, I wanted to talk, if I could, for a moment about the possibility of redesignated North Korea as a state sponsor of terrorism. And I, I raise this because you recall that the, the designation was actually removed as part of a negotiation. And um, my understanding is that the North Koreans did not keep their end of the bargain on that negotiation. Um, I know that you're currently pursuing a strategy of maximum pressure, as it's called, against the regime. And um, I just wonder why this isn't one of the things that you're looking at. Um, the Perry Initiative during President Clinton's administration was where this was removed. Uh, uh, the Bush administration, it, it, was, it was discussed, I'm sorry, during the Perry Initiative, the Bush administration's removal of the regime from the list in 2008 was based upon an agreement by North Korea to disable its plutonium factory um, and for the complete and correct declaration of its nuclear programs. None of those things happened. Today, we understand that plutonium production continues at Yongbyon, and it's an important part of the North Korean nuclear program. And uh, if I'm wrong about that, I'd like to hear from you, Ms. Thornton. Um, and we're nowhere near having a complete and correct understanding of their nuclear program, of course. So the removal from the list in 2008 was you know, closely linked to negotiating limitations on the program and changes in international behavior by the regime, and it never happened. 
Director Coates has now outlined in his worldwide threat assessment, just came out a couple months ago, that North Korea's record of sharing dangerous nuclear and missile technology with state sponsors of terrorism, including Iran and Syria, continues to pose a serious threat not just to the U.S., but to the security environment in East Asia and elsewhere. So, you know, sharing dangerous nuclear weapon uh, technology with Iran, a state sponsor of terrorism, should seem to be a, an important link to terrorism. In addition, the regime has built a long record, of course, of kidnapping and murder. Its treatment of Japanese nationals was an important part of their designation previously. Um, unfortunately, they've made a habit now of detaining Americans. And as you know, one of my constituents, Otto Warmbier, was one of those who was detained. And uh, that detention, in essence, turned into a death sentence for him, improperly detained. And uh, so my question to you would be um, whether you all are weighing the redesignation of Korea as a state sponsor of terrorism um, and uh, what the status of that decision making is. And if you're not doing that, um, uh, why aren't you doing that? Thank you. Thank you, Senator, very much yep. for that question. And of course, let me just start by saying that our hearts really do go out to the family of Otto Warmbier. Mm -hmm. It was a reprehensible tragedy and something that no one should have to go through. And um, I certainly appreciate the sentiment behind your question. And I think uh, we all are uh, very concerned about um, humanitarian conditions inside North Korea and about actions by the regime that um, are um, very much outside the bounds of any kind of responsible state actor. And I think on the issue of the um, state sponsors of terrorism, uh, we are reviewing um, that um, issue right now. It is um, an issue that the, the secretary has taken an interest in. Um, there are a lot of technical and legal aspects to it, so I can't tell you with great specificity where we are in the review right now, but uh, we are uh, looking at the issue of uh, designation. Um, and I, I could give you more information perhaps at a later date. Well, I appreciate that information, but I would like to ask that you uh, get back to me, and I assume the chairman and ranking member would be interested as well as to what the thinking is and what the considerations are. Uh, you said it's a highly technical decision. I, you know, I know you have to meet certain requirements. Again, providing missile technology to countries that we consider some of the top state sponsors of terrorism would seem to be a link. And then, of course, how they treat it, uh, not just uh, other countries' citizens, but ours. And by the way, with regard to Otto Warmbier, uh, I want to thank you again. I've done this uh, before this committee a couple of times, including when Deputy Secretary Sullivan was here. I appreciate his personal involvement. As you know, Ambassador Joe Yoon was uh, critical to us being able to ultimately bring Otto home. And uh, so we appreciate the State Department's um, increased and uh, you know, highly personal efforts uh, over the last couple of months. And um, again, the, the process that we've gone through the last 18 months with uh, DPRK with regard to Otto Warmbier uh, indicates to me the level of depravity that uh, exists within that regime. Uh, one final question, if I could, Mr. Chairman, this has to do with economic sanctions. You know, we've, uh, many of us have talked about the, the imposition of broader sanctions by giving, tricking more Chinese companies brought into the sanctions regime because there are hundreds, if not thousands, of Chinese companies, as I understand it, still doing business with North Korea, some of whom are involved with dual technology that's had an effect not just on their commercial activities, but also their military activities. Um, but let me ask you about the sanctions that are in place. Um, are, they, are they working? Are they affecting the pace with which the country of North Korea has been able to develop and test uh, its nuclear and ballistic, ballistic uh, missile programs? And, to what sources of funding has the regime resorted to in order to get around some of these sanctions? Thank you very much for that question. Um, I think that what we see is as we build this global kind of network um, to try to increase the pressure on the regime and prevent proliferation especially um, of illicit technology going to North Korea, 
that um, there, there has been some effect. We are affecting their ability to get things that they need. Um, it hasn't unfortunately slowed down their missile testing program, but we do see them needing to resort to um, you know, new avenues of um, access to get imports and other things. I think um, that is one of the desired um, goals of the sanctions regime is to make things more difficult for them, obviously, to proceed with their weapons programs. Um, I think, you know, one um, aspect of this is, you know, as the uh, pressure on the regime, on sanctions, on their inability to transact financial transactions and move things easily across borders without being subject to inspection, et cetera, uh, they will start to look for new avenues of, of outlet. And that's one of the reasons why we've been uh, so insistent on traveling out to countries that you wouldn't normally think of as being partners of North Korea to try to shore up the resolve of countries all over the world to keep North Korea from accessing markets that they may now be turning to when things get more difficult in the nearby neighborhood. Uh, but I think, uh, unfortunately, um, uh, you know, we've not seen their uh, missile program slow down. Um, in fact, it seems that they are testing at the same rapid rate that they, that they have been testing at lately. And um, so we're continuing to talk to, uh, to China about that. We're continuing to try to impinge on sources of particularly hard currency uh, financing. Um, but we do find that a lot of their production has gone uh, now indigenous, and um, it's become harder and harder to, to stop um, this kind of um, activity in North Korea. Uh, I think, um, you know, as we work with China, I mean, everybody in the UN sanctions network is conscious, and that's one of the things the UN panel of experts is doing, keeping particular track on uh, items and um, dual use items that may be of use to North Korea and trying to uh, make sure that we close down those avenues. But we've also sort of just started to work on this and we have a lot of um, conversations and capacity building to do with other countries. Some countries have more capacity to catch these things at customs than others, et cetera. And that's one of the things in our conversations with our Chinese colleagues that we've talked about is you know, providing customs assistance for them on the border to catch a lot of this stuff that goes into North Korea, and we're working on that with them, as are some of our other like-minded allies in the region. Well, Ms. Horton, I hope we will redouble our efforts to work on that, because the alternative is frightening, not just for the region, and certainly Japan and South Korea recognize that now, uh, but also for the, the, the broader region, including China, um, and what could happen on their border um, with DPRK. And uh, now with this new testing of intercontinental ballistic missile, you know, really for the whole world. So right. I, I would hope that we would not only put more pressure on these countries, uh, but that we would apply that, that pressure in a way that's uh, clear that it's in their self-interest uh, to avoid the, the potential um, calamity that could occur if we do not more effectively through sanctions and peaceful means um, curtail what they're able to able to do on their missile program and on their nuclear program. So I, I'm, I know the chairman is holding this hearing in part to put attention on this issue, and um, I would certainly hope that is a top priority of the administration, and it, again, in the self-interest of these other countries to, to avoid a much more uh, drastic result. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Portman. And I, I, before before we turn to the next panel, Secretary Thornton, I would just like to add that if we could get a time frame from the State Department on the designation of state sponsor of terror, I think it's important. Uh, you know, it is clear whether it's the murderous actions the regime has taken uh, against its own people, uh, others, the imprisonments uh, that are uh, you know, th that they continue to um, responsible for, uh, whether it's the missile launches they continue, uh, its interaction with Iran. Uh, this decision needs to be made soon, and it needs to be, I believe, uh, a redesignation of that, that uh, state sponsor of terror. Uh, so thank you, Secretary Thornton, for your testimony today, and uh, again, apologies uh, for the late start. Thank we'll go ahead and bring up the second panel uh, to begin uh, their testimony. Uh, the first witness on our second panel today is Bruce Klingner, who serves as a senior research fellow at the Heritage Foundation. 
Uh, prior to joining Heritage in 2007, Mr. Klingner spent 20 years serving at the Central Intelligence Agency and the Defense Intelligence Agency focusing on the Korean Peninsula, including as chief for the CIA's Korea branch and as CIA's deputy division chief for Korea. Welcome, Mr. Klingner, and our second witness and final witness uh, of the second panel is Mr. Leon Siegel, Siegel I believe, not Seagal, Siegel, Siegel, uh, who currently serves as director of the Northeast Asia Cooperative Security Project at the Social Science Research Council in New York. He is an author of numerous books on nuclear nonproliferation issues, has taught at Columbia University and Princeton University, and has also served as a member uh, of the editorial board of the New York Times from 1989 to 1995. Welcome, Mr. Siegel, and thank you for being with us today. Mr. Klingner, if you would uh, begin. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Markey. Uh, it's truly an honor to be asked to appear before you on such an important issue to our national security. Uh, the imminence of Pyongyang's crossing of the ICBM threshold has triggered greater advocacy for a, by some for a U.S. preemptive military attack to prevent North Korea from obtaining its, its objective. But preemptive attacks on test flights that do not clearly pose a security risk uh, could trigger an all-out war with catastrophic consequences. So while the U.S. should be steadfast in its defenses of its territory and its allies, it, it should save a preemptive military strike for indications of imminent North Korean attack. Conversely, others push for a return in negotiations. Uh, but we've been down that path many times before, and all were unsuccessful. North, Co North Korea pledged in several international agreements uh, to never develop nuclear weapons, and once caught with its hand in the nuclear cookie jar, uh, acceded to several subsequent agreements to give up the weapons they promised never to build in the first place. The U.S. and its allies have offered economic benefits, devel developmental assistance, humanitarian assistance, diplomatic recognition, declaration of non-hostility, turning a blind eye to violations, and not implementing U.S. laws. By word and deed, North Korea has repeatedly and emphatically shown it has no intention of abandoning its nuclear weapons under present circumstances. It's also difficult to have a dialogue with a country that shuns it. North Korea closed the New York Channel in July 2016, severing the last official link between our governments until allowing dialogue recently to facilitate the return of the comatose and dying Otto Ormbier. North Korea literally refuses to pick up the phone in the, uh, both in the Joint Security Area in the DMZ uh, and the Inter-Korean Military Hotline in the West Sea. And North Korea has already rejected several attempts at engagement by South Korean President Moon Jae-in. Uh, they've dismissed them as nonsense. So South Korea has also tried engagement, having 240 inter-Korean agreements. Uh, proposals for returning to negotiations, such as the freeze for freeze option, all share a common theme in calling for yet more concessions by the U.S. in return for a commitment by the North to undertake a portion of what it is already obligated to do under numerous U.N. resolutions. And the best way to engage in negotiations would be after a comprehensive, rigorous, and sustained international strategy. Such a policy upholds U.S. laws and U.N. resolutions, imposes a penalty on those that violate them, puts in place measures both to make it harder for North Korea to import uh, items that they need for their new prohibited programs, as well as constrained proliferation. So North Korea must be held accountable for its actions, and to re refrain from doing so would be to condone illegal activity and give de facto immunity from U.S. and international law and undermine U.N. resolutions. Successive U.S. administrations have talked tough about pressuring to North Korea, but instead, instead engaged in timid incrementalism in imposing sanctions and defending U.S. law. And U.S. officials responsible for sanctions, if you talk to them privately, will say, yes, they have lists and evidence of North Korean, Chinese, and other entities that are violation, but they were prevented from implementing and enforcing those laws. Uh, although President Trump has criticized President Obama's strategic patience policy as weak and effectual, he has yet to distinguish his North Korea policy from his predecessors. Uh, Trump's policy of maximum pressure to date has been anything but, and he continues to pull American punches against North Korean and Chinese violations of U.S. law. However, the Trump administration recently expressed frustration with Beijing's foot dragging on uh, pressuring North Korea and took actions against the Bank of, uh, Bank of Dandung and a few other entities. Um, we're hearing, again, that there are indications they will be sanctioning additional Chinese violators, and I certainly hope that is the case. Um, we also have to highlight and condemn Pyongyang's crimes against humanity. Uh, advocacy for human rights must be a component of U.S. policy. Americans were rightly appalled by the death of Otto Warmbier, 
but we must not lose sight of the brutal and reprehensible human rights violations that the regime imposes on its own citizens, which the UN Commission of Inquiry assessed constituted crimes against humanity. In July 2016, the Obama administration uh, for the first time imposed human rights sanctions on a handful of North Korean entities, but since then the U.S. has not taken any further action. So in conclusion, the most sensible policy is to increase pressure in response to Pyongyang's repeated defiance of the international community while ensuring the U.S. has sufficient defenses for itself and its allies and leaving the door open to diplomatic efforts. But at present, any offer of economic inducements to it uh, entice North Korea to abandon its nuclear arsenal has little to no chance of success. Thank you again for the privilege of appearing before you. Thank you, Mr. Klingner and Mr. Siegel. We'll begin with your testimony. I, I, mentioned, I forgot to mention to you how uh, sorry we are for the late start as well. So thank you both uh, for being here, Mr. Siegel. Uh, thank you, Chairman Gardner, Ranking Member Markey. Uh, thanks for inviting me to appear before you today. Um, the current unbounded North Korean weapons program poses a clear and present danger to the U.S. and allied security. That makes it a matter of great urgency to negotiate a suspension of its nuclear missile testing and fissile material production, even if the North is unwilling to recommit to complete denuclearization up front. Have no doubt about it, complete denuclearization remains the goal. But demanding that Pyongyang pledge that now will only delay a possible agreement, enabling it to add to its military wherewithal and bargaining leverage in the meantime. Now, soon after taking office, President Trump wisely resumed diplomatic engagement with Pyongyang. Those talks are now in, abey in abeyance. Restarting them is imperative. The experience is that pressure without negotiations has never worked in the past with Pyongyang, and there's no reason to think it will work now. The question to ask about people who prefer the sanctions-only approach is, how long will it take for the, nor for the sanctions to work to get North Korea to accept our negotiating position and to stop their ICBM testing, their nuclear testing, and their fissile material production. How long? Um, with that in mind, it seems to me legislation now under consideration should not immediately trigger sanctions, but provide for at least a three-month implementation period to allow time for talks. Three months isn't going to make a difference in terms of the if impact of the sanctions, but it may open the opportunity for talks if we're willing to talk. Now, Washington is preoccupied with getting Beijing to put more pressure on Pyongyang, but it's worth recalling that on three occasions when China and the United States worked together in the UN Security Council to impose tougher sanctions in 2006, 2009, 2013, North Korea responded by conducting nuclear tests in, a, in an effort to drive them apart. That, interestingly enough, did not happen after Washington and Beijing agreed on the much tougher Security Council sanctions last November. Instead, Kim Jong-un defied widespread expectations he would soon conduct a sixth nuclear test as a signal of restraint in the expectation that President Trump would open talks. If we delay talks, we may get that test. The recent test launch of an ICBM underscores how the prospect of tougher sanctions without talks prompts Pyongyang to step up army. A policy of maximum pressure and engagement can only succeed if nuclear diplomacy is soon resumed and the North security concerns are addressed. We must not lose sight of the fact that it's North Korea that we need to persuade, not China. And that means taking account of North Korea's strategy. During the Cold War, Kim, Kim Il-sung played China off against the Soviet Union to maintain his freedom of maneuver. In 1988, anticipating the collapse of the Soviet Union, he reached out to improve relations with the United States, South Korea, and Japan in order to avoid overdependence on China. That has been the Kim's objective ever since. From Pyongyang's vantage point, that aim was the basis of the 1994 agreed framework and the September 2005 six-party joint statement. For Washington, obviously, suspension of, North, of Pyongyang's nuclear and missile programs was the point of those agreements, which succeeded for a time in shuttering the North's pr production of fissile material 
and stopping the test launches of medium and longer range missiles. Both agreements collapsed, however, when Washington did little to implement its commitment to improve relations, and of course, Pyongyang reneged on denuclearization. That passed this prologue. Now there are indications that a suspension of North Korean missile and nuclear testing and fissile material production may again prove negotiable. In return for a suspension of its production of plutonium and enriched uranium, the trading with the enemy act sanctions imposed before the nuclear issue arose, could be relaxed for yet a third time, and energy assistance unilaterally halted by South Korea in 2008 could be resumed. An agreement will require addressing Pyongyang's security needs, including adjusting our joint exercises with South Korea, for instance, by suspending flights of nuclear-capable B-52 bombers into Korean airspace. Those flights were only resumed, I want to remind you, to reassure allies in the aftermath of the North's nuclear test. If those tests are suspended, B-52 flights can be two without any sacrifice of deterrence. North Korea is well aware of the rich reach of US ICBMs and SLBMs, which, by the way, were recently test launched, to remind them. The US can also continue to bolster, rotate, and exercise forces in the region so conventional deterrence will remain robust. The chances of persuading North Korea to go beyond another temporary suspension to dismantle its nuclear and missile programs, however, are slim without firm commitments from Washington and Seoul to move toward political and economic normalization, engage in a peace process to end the Korean War, and negotiate security arrangements, among them a nuclear-free weapons, nuclear weapons-free zone that would provide a multilateral legal framework for denuclearization. In that context, President Trump's willingness to hold out the prospect of a summit with Kim Jong-un would also be a significant inducement. Let me say in closing, we know what North Korea is like with its one-man rule, cult of personality, internal regimentation, and dogmatic devotion to Juche ideology. It's a decidedly bad state. That's what we Americans know about North Korea. The wisest analyst I know once wrote, finding the truth about the North's nuclear program is an example of what we know sometimes leads us away from what we need to learn. The best way to learn is to enter into talks about talks and probe whether Pyongyang is willing to change course. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sing Siegel, for your testimony today to both of you. Uh, Senator Markey, if you, would, uh, if, if you have any questions, I, I just would start uh, with a brief question. Uh, you heard from Secretary Thornton uh, talk about some of the pillars that they laid out. Mr. Klingner, you said, how is this uh, policy of the administration any different than uh, strategic patience? Uh, if, if the actions uh, that they have laid out don't result in additional pressure, uh, it, it is strategic patience. Is that correct? I, I think the, the, the real test is what actions are implemented. We, we've heard from successive administrations, tough talk, uh, when President Obama said North Korea is the most heavily sanctioned, the most cut off nation on earth, he was flat out wrong, uh, as you pointed out in your, in your opening comments. So it's really the actions that carry through on these pledges of pressure. So you know, I, I'm waiting to see the, the length of the list of sanctions uh, of entities that will be sanctioned, not only North Korean, uh, but as you've pointed out, the Chinese violators of U.S. law. And would a more global approach to denial of uh, access to financial networks be something that you think could actually work? I, I think so, sir. I, I think we need to have really a, a full spectrum of, and a comprehensive integrated strategy. Uh, too often the, the debate in Washington is, is sanctions versus engagement. Uh, you know, they're two sides of the same coin. You need both of them. Uh, they're working in, in conjunction with each other, along with other measures of information operations, uh, human rights advocacy, deterrence, et cetera. Uh, but I think we do need to you know, augment the, the sanctions that we have. There are, as you've said, proposed legislation will, which will plug holes, which will uh, you know, augment measures. In many ways, though, they're trying to induce this administration, as the previous administration, to use the th authorities they've long had to fully enforce UN resolutions and US laws. Mr. Siegel, why won't China, responsible for 90% of North Korea's economy, uh, why won't China simply go to uh, Kim Jong-un uh, and say, let's uh, step down your nuclear program and begin the conversations that you talk about? I, I think, Mr. Chairman, yeah, sorry. I think, Mr. Chairman, they have. 
the, the problem is that the Chinese, I think, understand the situation somewhat similarly to what I've tried to suggest, which is that the North Koreans want to change their relationship with us as a hedge against China. They don't want to be dependent on China. They also understand that when they've put, joined with the US at the UN and voted for tougher sanctions resolutions, and in most cases implemented them, at least most of them, the North Korean response on three occasions was to test a nuclear weapon in order to drive the two of us apart. So I think part of this is there seems to be, in the Chinese mind, a different logic working because they seem to grasp what the North Koreans seem to want. And I think we have to, unfortunately, grasp what the North Koreans want, which is an improved relationship with us because they don't want to be dependent on China. Senator Markey. Thank, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you um, uh, both for excellent testimony. Um, uh, Mr. Siegel, it's often implied that the only way the United States can engage in dialogue with North Korea is by giving it economic or other concessions or by conceding the ultimate goal of any talks, complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. But I believe there are many circumstances under which we could engage in talks with North Korea that would not require concessions uh, that would not impact our ability to ensure the safety and security of our allies and would not remove any options for the United States to deal with the North Korean challenge. Mr. Siegel, your testimony indicates that you may feel the same. Can you share your opinion on some of the different ways the United States can engage with North Korea without having to provide economic concessions or without having our allies question our commitment to their safety or security? Yes, sir. Um, first of all, from the North Korean vantage point vis-a-vis -vis the United States, not necessarily vis-a-vis -vis others, this has never been about economics. It's been about the relationship. The only interest they have in sanctions easing is not because they expect Fortune 500 companies to rush into North Korea and invest. It is because it's a sign to them of enmity, the Trading with the Enemy Act. I mean, how clear could it be? Secondly, with respect to a thing that obviously a lot of people worry about, that the first thing they'll want in a peace process is US troops to go out. If that's what they want, we're not going to give it to them, are we? We will only take our troops out of South Korea if South Koreans ask us to do that. And the North Koreans know that. Indeed, the North Koreans for many years, until at least a couple of years ago, kept talking about essentially this. When the, if the United States is our enemy, US troops in South Korea are a threat to us, and they have to go. But if the United States is no longer our enemy, those troops are no longer a threat to us and they can stay. And indeed, the North Koreans on numerous occasions, the last of them a couple of years ago, talked about the US, it's a bridge too far, and, so, and North Korea being allies. You can have two allies. You can be allied to South Korea and you can be allied to us. They were looking for a formulation to change the relationship. That's what this is about. In a world in which the relationship is changed, it is possible to imagine, I am not saying it's likely, but it is possible to imagine that the North Koreans down a long road will become convinced we are no longer their enemy and they don't need nuclear weapons to protect themselves. I don't think there's a sign we can get there now because of our politics and because of their politics. But we've got to stop the programs now to give ourselves the chance to do that. And I know of no other way to get them to get rid of their nuclear weapons. Thank you, Mr. Siegel. Uh, Mr. Klingner, um, we convinced, in quotes, um, Gaddafi to give up his nuclear weapon program. We convinced, in quotes, Saddam Hussein to give up his nuclear weapon program, and then subsequently we engaged, participated in a process that led to their deaths. So if you're Kim, and you're looking at the United States and uh, the goal, uh, ultimately, to denuclearize, uh, what 
does he need as a guarantee for his own personal safety uh, in order to convince him that it's worth his while to engage in talks that could head towards denuclearization? And ultimately, um, what are the concessions or the commitments that the United States would have to make in order to get him to accept that premise? Uh, North Koreans have used those ex same examples in explaining why they will never, ever negotiate away their nuclear weapons. Uh, exactly. Right. They have said, denuclearization is off the table. There's nothing you can offer us. We are prepared to talk about a peace treaty or fight. So unless we change their calculus, uh, then they will not negotiate away those nuclear weapons. In the meantime, the, the, the pressure, the sanctions, the targeted financial measures are fulfilling a number of other objectives as we hope we can get to a negotiated uh, position. In the meantime, we are enforcing our law. We're no longer turning a blind eye to violations. And as I mentioned, you know, we're putting in place measures to constrict both the inflow and outflow of prohibited nuclear missile components. So when you look at this um, uh, recent dramatic increase in trade between North Korea and um, China, uh, what, is your, what is your message to the Trump administration in terms of what they have to do, in terms of telescoping the time frame to ensure that the North Korean economy is not benefiting from these Chinese trade, given the rapid movement that they have made towards the uh, integration of a ICBM with a nuclear warhead. I, I would say we need to uh, distinguish between diplomacy and law enforcement and give that message to China so that U.S. law is not negotiable. Uh, those entities that come into the U.S. financial system and misuse it in violation of U.S. law will be treated accordingly. So, and then with diplomacy, we continue to try to convince Beijing to more fully implement required U.N. sanctions. We work with them to try to uh, reduce their support for the regime. But those things that are against U.S. law, against U.N. resolutions, those are not negotiable. So, so can, we, can we change the calculus in the... North Korean regime's mentality that they don't want to have a repetition of what happened in uh, Libya and uh, Iraq affect them without our legislation passing and without the already existing sanctions being tightened in order to force a, a, a negotiation in a time frame that actually avoids perhaps the irreversible moment in our relationship. I, I think the first step is you need to change the calculus of the Chinese banks and businesses that are engaging with North Korea, and you can do that through U.S. law. So you can wean them away from engaging with North Korea, and we've seen that in the past when the U.S. Uh, took action and then had private meetings throughout Asia to induce 24 entities, including entire countries and the Bank of China to defy the Chinese government by cutting off its interaction uh, with North Korea. If we go after those uh, or Chinese organizations, as Senator Gardner pointed out, there's, you can have a few small number of very influential actions you can take mm -hmm. that have repercussions across a much broader scale. You use the laws to take out the criminal organizations, and you also change the calculus for legitimate businesses who see it as no longer in their business interest to engage with North Korea. So you can tighten the regime by enforcing U.S. law. So compared to the sanctions that are already on the books, and thus far their lack of efficacy, efficacy um, and the proposal that uh, Senator Gardner and I have uh, introduced, um, what is your view about our legislation in terms of serving as an additional weapon in the arsenal, the diplomatic arsenal, which the Trump administration can use? And uh, how would such legisla our legislation complement existing laws already on the books? I, I think it, it very well complements existing uh, legislation and existing executive orders and regulations. Uh, but again, the problem or the question will always be, will the executive branch of any administration actually use the powers that they've been given? It's like the mayor of a city saying, I'm tough on crime, 
uh, but then not, tell, not having his police department enforce those that they have evidence against. Uh, and my view is that if they don't, then it's going to lead inexorably, inevitably, uh, to a North Korean ICBM nuclear weapons program that is completed. So um, I don't think as a nation there's an option. I think the president has to become tougher on the Chinese. They're the safety valve. They're the release valve that the North Koreans are using, and they're punishing the South Koreans rather than the North Koreans. Uh, and I think ultimately, uh, unless we get more real about what's happening, uh, then, uh, then we're just on a, a, a collision course uh, with a, a North Korean uh, uh, nuclear weapons armed ICBM capable um, uh, uh, posture for the rest of our lives. Do you agree with that, Mr. Siegel? I, I agree with that, but I think what you said earlier is just as important, which is you have to open the way to negotiation. Exactly. That's the key. Exactly. And not on our terms, but actually talks about talks to get them to stop. In a circumstance in which they have suspended their testing and their fissile material production, that period is much more secure. We want to prolong that suspension as much as possible and go beyond it to get them to dismantle the facilities they have for producing more missiles and then ultimately get the weapons. The weapons are going to come last. They're going to come down a very long road because they need to be assured the relationship has changed. That's the structure of a deal that at least is remotely possible. Is it likely? I wouldn't bet on that. Negotiations are not guaranteed. But sanctions seem to me a very long road to nowhere at this point, right. well, if done alone. Again, what if we're done saying alone, is, what you're our, saying both. My view is sanctions. My view is sanctions with direct Absolutely. So that that's my view, too. It, so can, can, you, can you just both, and I apologize, Mr. Just can you each give me your one minute summary, just your one minute that you want the chairman and I to remember from your testimony as we move forward during this very uh, perilous time in our relationship with North Korea? I, I would say realize that, that all the hype that sanctions have been implemented and failed ha is incorrect. They have not been tried to the full extent. Uh, the legislation last year induced the Obama administration to do its three actions against North Korea, which was because of the legislation. We need to increase the pressure. Yes, we want to get to negotiations, but I would distinguish between di diplomatic discussion between diplomats as opposed to resuming formal negotiations where you lose control of the momentum and it often requires U.S. concessions so the negotiations don't fail. Have diplomatic discussions with, um, amongst the, the, the uh, State Department and their MOFA counterparts, um, but realize that's been tried many times before and they're the ones that have been refusing to talk. Yeah. Mr. Siegel. I think sanctions are important, but they have to be married with negotiations. The only way in, in the time that we need to stop an ICBM and stop a boosted energy or, or thermonuclear device in, by North Korea is to get negotiations going and see whether they will stop testing and stop fissile material production. That takes both sanctions and negotiation. I, I thank both of you, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman, yeah. for this excellent hearing. No, thank you. Uh, thanks to all of you. Thanks again uh, for being here and apologize for the late start. Uh, thank you all for being a part of this hearing. The, for the information of the members, the record will be remain open until uh, the close of business on Friday, including for members to submit questions for the record. Kindly ask the witnesses to respond as quickly as possible, and your responses will be made a part of the record. Thanks to the committee. This hearing is now adjourned.